Hey everyone, welcome back to Here and Apologetics. I'm so pumped that you are joining us today. As always, this podcast is brought to you guys at patreon.com slash adhere and apologetics. Um, today I have Dr. Jeffrey Kapersky. Um, he is a professor at Saginaw Valley State University. Uh, today we're going to be looking at a paper he wrote um, called When Dialogue Was the Norm, Theology and the Rise of Modern Science. But Jeff, thank you so much for joining me. How you doing? I'm doing really well, Zach. Thanks for having me back. I think this is my second, second appearance on the show. So yeah, I'm very happy to be back. Yeah, I believe so. And it's great talking with you. Um, yeah, I'm really excited. Do you want to talk a little bit about like who you are, what you do, and what kind of kind of got you interested in questions like how like theology relates to like the rise of modern science? Oh, sure. So um, I'm, a, I'm a philosopher of science. Uh, as you said, I teach at Saginaw Valley State University. I've been there 27 years now. So um, uh, my undergraduate degree was, was in engineering. So I was not always a, a philosopher, um, made, made the transition in graduate school. Um, and originally I was just, I was a really just main philosophy of, uh, philosophy of physics, really straightforward, high tech stuff. My dissertation was on chaos theory and that's what I was writing on early. Um, and eventually, uh, partly because I have interests in, in, in matters of theology and philosophy of religion, uh, I kind of, kind of get drawn into questions of, of the relation between science and religion. So really in the last I don't know, five to 10 years, like almost everything I've done is somehow or other has been on this intersection between, between science and religion and, and, um, uh, and philosophy as well, where those three tend to intersect. So Jeff, what got you like specifically to like write this paper? Um, we're looking at like the rise of like modern science related to theology, kind of talk about like, like the basis of like the framework of your interest here. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it probably it was historical. Um, so my, my, my training really was more uh, modern. I was interested in quantum mechanics and relativity and, and chaos and things like that. And in my first book, I, I realized I had to um, I had to have a little bit of a, of a history component. Uh, and so I started digging into the history more than I ever had in graduate school uh, and just realized, wow, there's there's a lot of really interesting stuff here. Uh, there were things, mainly that some of the things that I had been taught, some of the stereotypes that I had been taught about, um, about the history of science really did not hold up very well. Um, my sense was, I mean, we, I, it was clear that that they, you know, Newton and Descartes and people in, during the scientific revolution, they were more theistic. They would, you know, talk about God every once in a while in their writings, but kind of the standard view was that they did that just because it was a more religious time, and they're trying to keep the religious authorities off their backs, and so they sprinkle that in. And it turns out that actually no, that the theology was, was intimately related uh, to their philosophy and their science in ways that I was I was told you could kind of just pass over the God stuff, and it turns out no, you really don't understand what they're talking about if you pass over the God stuff. So in your work, Jeff, you talk about like this idea of like meta theoretic shaping principles, um, which I'm like, ooh, like that's a lot of big words. Like I feel like yeah. I piece out like, OK, meta is like big. I think I could be wrong. Theoretic. I'm thinking like theories um, and then shaping principles, like ideas, maybe. I don't know. I'm just kind of roughly like doing my like trying to put my like high school English cap back on trying to like make sense of these words. Um, what are you talking about when you're talking about like meta theoretic shaping principles? Good. That's a that's a, uh, a, um, a technical term that, that yeah, I, I use. And so it, it's this. Um, in, in my philosophy of science course, I use a simple kind of three-part model for modern science. You can think of it kind of like a pyramid. So at the base of the pyramid, you've got observations and data. And so anybody who's taken a, you know, just a high school chem lab knows what, what that is all about. And at the second la level, you have uh, theories, models, and laws. And so the stuff going on at that second level is trying to make sense of uh, what's going on at the base, what make, make sense of all that data. And so that all that's familiar, but there's another level, uh, which I call meta theoretic shaping principles, the meta theoretic meta is above. So it's above theory. You can just call them shaping principles. And this is where science and philosophy overlap. Uh, these have uh, some 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 shaping principles had to do with the fundamental assumptions about what reality is like. We're going to go out there and study physical reality. We have certain philosophical assumptions about what that reality is like. And we have other assumptions about how it is, how it is best for us to go about studying that reality. So those are the, those are the meta theoretic. That's what a meta theoretic shaping principle is roughly. Okay. That's helpful. And like, maybe like Jeffrey could, or Jeff, can you, could you give me some examples of like these meta theoretic principles? 
Sure. So um, first one would be th that there are laws of nature. That's going to be a really important one. It's kind of the, the centerpiece of that paper that I wrote. Um, the ancients knew that the world was orderly, but they didn't think about it in terms of laws, of laws of nature. So if you had asked Aristotle, hey, you know, rocks, every time I pick up a rock, it falls, you know, right, right, right straight down. Why? Why does that work? And the Aristotelians would say, well, in some sense, that's that's what the rock wants to do. The rock and everything else ha has an essence or a nature that more or less tells the the rock what what it should do. And so, falling is just naturally what what rocks do. It's, it's what they do by their nature, by their essence. Well, in the seventeenth century, all that talk of essences, all that got thrown out, and it gets replaced by this far more familiar notion, the one that you're familiar with, laws of nature, that there are laws and those then govern the way things work. That, it's the law of gravity that is responsible for the rock falling, not its not its essence. And so this notion that there are individual laws for different phenomena, that's a really important shaping principle. Another one would be the uniformity of nature. So this one says that, that the laws are the same everywhere. The laws aren't just local. It's not like there's just one set of laws in our solar system and then another, another, another whole set of laws laws in Andromeda, same laws everywhere, and then the same laws across time. So it's not as if the laws change you know, in, the, in the previous century and we think they're going to change. So uniformity of nature, there's, there's shaping principles about causation. Uh, one is that causes always come before their effects. And you might say, well, that seems pretty obvious, but actually engineers use this because there are some equations that um, where you, you run the solutions and it looks like that in some cases an effect can show up before its cause does. And that's what that's what the math allows. And we come along and say, well, maybe that's what the math allows, but no, <laughs> that's that's not how reality works. And so it might be mathematically possible. It's not it's not physically possible. There are shaping principles about experimentation. So the medievals didn't do a lot of experiments. They thought experiments involved what they called violent motion. So you take that rock again, when it falls, that was natural motion. That's what the rock wants to do. If I take that same rock and put it on my table, and I, I could push it from side to side, but that's not what it wants to do. And we can tell because it stops moving as soon as I take my hand away. So that sort of motion was called violent motion. And the medievals thought that, that really you couldn't learn anything useful about nature from violent motion. And from their point of view, experiments that we would think of today as experiments, that, all, that always involves violent motion. So they actually had reasons for not doing experiments. Once we got rid of that whole notion, the, the distinction between violent and natural motion, all of a sudden everybody's doing experiments. It's okay to do experiments now. And we learn all sorts of you know, really important things. I'll give you one more. Uh, there's a whole set of um, things philosophers call explanatory virtues, things we want from a good scientific explanation. So we want our explanations to, to fit the data, we want them to be not overly complex. We would like them to be simple. We'd like them to be testable, uh, that we can put them to some sort of experimental test. We want them to fit with other theories, other things that we already know. We want them to be fruitful for future research and sometimes even mathematically elegant. So there, there's a, there's a handful of, of meta-theoretic shaping principles. So we have these like meta theoretic shaping principles, Jeff, that like, if, I, if I'm tracking with you, like these are things that like guide the universe in a sense, like we have like laws of nature um, mm -hmm. and it, like they exist across the universe. Like we don't go to Mars and things are just like suddenly different and our like fundamental laws of nature are different. Right. Right. And it's also that like these ideas, like um, they're uniform, as you said, um, and there's a bunch of different ones relating to different topics. I'm curious now, like Jeff, like, what does this have to do with like then theology then? Cause it seems like you just talked a lot about science. So like theology, like why bring this in Jeff? Good. So I, I said that shipping principles were the intersection of science and philosophy, but, but really it's, it's science, philosophy and theology. So let me go over a couple of those that I, I just mentioned. It's like the laws of nature, very familiar notion, but almost everyone at any big name that you could come up with, around the time of the scientific revolution, they all believe that, that God ordained the laws. That's where the laws of nature come from. So God doesn't need these, these intermediaries like, like Aristotelian essences to kind of govern rocks and fire and clouds on his behalf. God just directly governs nature and he does so by just decreeing how things are going to go. This is, this is how it's gonna go. And those decrees are what we call the laws of nature. So until recently, like, 
everyone who was talking about laws of nature would have associated them with God. Now, I know that's not that's not how it goes today, right? You learn about the laws of nature, in, I don't know, high school or middle school. No one's talking about God. But again, not not too long ago, everyone associated it with, with God. The um, the uniformity of nature. Wh why is nature uniform? Why are the laws the same you know, everywhere and throughout time? Descartes said, give it an explicit argument that that the laws remain the same over time because God is immutable. So God doesn't change. God has no reason to change his mind. So the laws he has decreed will will be the same throughout time. And then for Newton, um, he would have said the laws are the same everywhere because God is, is omnipresent. Everywhere God is, his laws are going to be the same. God is everywhere. The laws are going to be the same. So they also believed that um, God could have chosen other laws. He didn't have to choose the actual laws that we have in this universe. could have chosen other ones. But then that raises a problem. Like, how are we going to figure out? What choices God made, because God isn't isn't directly revealing his choices about nature to us. And the answer they came up with uh, was was empiricism. They said that um, God ordains the laws, but then he he leaves it up to us. We have to do the work. We have to go out, make the observations, do the experiments to to figure out what principles God actually used to to, to create nature. Um, so what this is showing is that there's a, there was a theological motivation for empirical science. The idea, the idea of, of empiricism wasn't the invention of a, of a naturalistic worldview. It was, it was theological. And then a couple of those explanatory virtues, simplicity, we want simple explanations. Descartes, Leibniz, Newton, they all gave theological arguments for like, this is the way God would do things. The same thing when it comes to mathematical elegance and the fundamental equations for reality. Um, if you had asked Kepler, he would say, look, we're just, when we're coming up with these equations, we're just thinking God's thoughts after him. Uh, and this is the way he, he did things. So the bottom line is this, is this. There are several fundamental principles that we're all familiar with. They're all familiar with the laws of nature, and they are still at work in science, and they have theistic roots. Um, and it turns out that there's really nothing controversial about this. Historians of science are well aware of that everything I've just told you. It just isn't very widely known. And instead, when you when you hear about the, the history of science and, and religion, what you get is is the warfare uh, you know, narrative. Science and religion have been at war since the beginning. Um, that's the more more typical picture you get. Um, none of the experts believe that. None of the experts believe in the in the warfare metaphor. So what you're saying, Jeff, is like a lot of these like meta theoretic principles you talk about. Like for example, you brought up the laws of nature. Like these are things um, that ar arose with like. Christian theology, um, is that correct? Um, mostly they were Christians. They weren't. They weren't all Christians, but certainly, yeah, um, they had they had you know theology behind it. Yeah. So I'm just wondering then, Jeff. Like, does that mean that like Christianity Christianity um, was responsible then for like the rise of science? Yeah, I, I I don't want to say that. That's that is a little bit too strong. I don't want to say that Christianity was responsible for the rise of science, but I do want to say that belief in God played a, a really important role. So I do think that without 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 God, without theism, you could have gotten and you did get like trial and error technologies, things like irrigation, um, uh, simple mas machines, even like pattern recognition, like in, in astronomy. But if you want to talk about theoretical science, the way we have it today, um, theism did a lot of work. So for example, scientific theories, they often get at the, the underlying structure and the organization of, of nature. Um, uh, they don't just summarize the data. They're explaining why we see what it is that we see. To do that sort of science, modern theor theoretical science, you have to have reasons to think that, first of all, there is some sort of order out there for us to discover and that we have the ability to, to discover that order. And again, every big name during the scientific revolution believed that, that, the, that there was a creator with a capital C who set up a rational system of laws and gave us the ability to discover it. So that's, that's why science could work. Do you think, Jeff, that like could modern science have like arisen elsewhere? Um, like we have a lot of these, like you mentioned, like, like maybe not just like a Christian framework, um, but they're kind of coming from this similar like theistic picture, right? A lot of these like principles, like in, if we're looking at like um, this time period, right? Yeah, I think um, in some, some theological systems, 
I could see I could see it happen. Other other types of theism, um, monotheism, I could see science have arisen, but um, it's much harder in, in some theological systems. Like you know, think polytheism. Let me just take a, take a couple of examples. Under polytheism, the gods, the individual gods, right? There's lo lots of gods running around. And they are directly responsible for, you know, some natural phenomena or so there's one God who's in charge of like lightning and there's another one like causes it to rain. So those gods, they, they didn't ordain laws for how things would go. They just, they just did, you know, whatever it is that they were going to do. Uh, in some Eastern cultures would give us a reason to actually doubt that our experience corresponds to reality. So there are, are some strands of Hinduism and Buddhism that would teach us that um, our experience to some degree, maybe to a large degree, uh, is actually an illusion. So if you think, for example, that, that your own your own selfhood right, is, is an illusion, you're never going to come up with things like conservation of energy or believe that, say, quarks exist. Um, there's just no reason to think under under that sort of system that we could ever know like what real physical reality um, was like. Um, and again, I think the clearest example of the need for for some sort of theism, uh, it goes back to the, to the law, laws of nature. I think it's really hard to see counterfactually how we could have come up with the notion of laws without a law giver, capital L. It looks like you're going to need some sort of monotheism or at least something in the neighborhood to, to come up with the, the notion of laws. We'd all been naturalists all the way along. We just probably would not have anything like the notion of, of, of laws of nature. I'm wondering, Jeff, like if we're looking at like the rise of modern science and how it's related to like it seems like monotheism, if I'm tracking with you, um, why didn't it arise sooner? Because if we, the people you're referencing, like these aren't people from like 100 AD or 200 AD or 300 AD looking at the origins of Christianity. Um, why didn't modern science arise sooner? Good. So in in the West, at least, I think it's it's pretty clear that it was held back uh, by this this Aristotelian uh, uh, worldview. Now, my my Aristotelian friends out there are not going to be happy to hear this, um, but I do I do think it's uh, true. Um, Aristotelians thought that we um, we could discover the essence of a thing. That was what was really important to to discover essences, natures. Um, and we could do it really mostly by, by just thinking really carefully about it. So like, you know, you go and you examine a bunch of cats uh, and then you just go and, and you think really hard about, about cats and try to intuit the, the, the nature of, of cat hood, right? Um, uh, that, that's how it would work. It was a very armchair kind, kind of thing. Um, the Aristotelians, I also said, were, were very biased against experiments, right? So this, this notion that there is this distinction between natural and violent motion that um, and where experiments were, were violent motion, violent motion couldn't tell you anything about essences. So there's a reason not to do experiments that held back modern science. There's another thing they believe. Um, there's a strict separation. The medievals believe ancient and medievals believe in a strict separation between the celestial realm and the, and the terrestrial realm. So the celestial realm, uh, that's where the heavenly bodies are. And that's the realm of, of perfection. Uh, it's, 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 it's unchanging. Uh, there's no, no kind of decay or anything like that up there. Um, and then, then there's us, the, the, the terrestrial realm where we live. And that is the realm of, of change and decay. You build a wall and eventually it falls over and you, you plant a tree and eventually it dies. That's, that's how things work here. So, so they denied them um, the uniformity of nature, right? For them, there was, there was one set of rules for the celestial realm, one set of rules for the terrestrial realm, and they were very, very different. So they, they didn't even have like a unified view of nature. Uh, you couldn't really do any, like what we think of as celestial mechanics and astronomy today. Uh, you, you couldn't do that, you know, back then, because it's just a different world that you're, that you're looking into. So once then the ideas of laws of nature came along and replaced Aristotelian essences, well, all of a sudden, as I said, you can do it, you can do experiments and they uh, turn out to be really successful. And we learn a lot from experiments. We can do celestial mechanics because it's all one world, right? It's all one, it's all one reality. The laws the same locally as they are way out there, you know, in, in the rest of the universe. Why did it take like Christianity so long to like maybe like um kind of give like the like the monotheistic worldview to like help rise to science um over like the Aristotelian view that you referenced, Jeff, because it seems like to me, like, okay, Christianity at the time of the rise of modern science has been around for a while. So like, is there a reason for this certain time that it kind of started to take the lead? Um, yeah, I'm just wondering. 
Well, there was at the time at the time of the scientific revolution. If you think of the of the, of the seventeenth century, um, there were a lot of things that were being shaken up at the time. So this is post Reformation. The, the Protestant Reformation had come along. Obviously, a lot, lot, lot of turmoil, a lot of change going on at that time. The the, the Columbus had discovered the so called the New World. Right, all of a sudden, there's there's just a lot more going on really um, in 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 in, uh, in the thought world of Europe uh, at the time. Um, so there, the idea that this was a time of, of change, uh, both theologically and then in terms of, they didn't call it science, they would have called it uh, natural philosophy. Um, th th it was a time of, of great change. And so you could start thinking about things differently. Uh, and certainly, um, certainly Copernicus was important in this. Um, the data that we use for doing astronomy uh, got increasingly better. Uh, and it looked like that in the system of, of planets under the heliocentric system, sorry, the geocentric system, that's where the Earth is the center of the universe. Um, the, the data you know, they, the, to, to fit the observations, they had to make you know, that system, the, heli the geocentric system, more and more complicated. And eventually Copernicus comes along and says, you know, you can, uh, you can simplify this whole thing if you just put the sun at the center and make all the planets, including us, go around that sun. It's a lot simpler. Uh, and so at the time, Gal Copernicus himself did not did not publish that work, uh, but after he died, obviously Galileo, if anybody knows that story, picked that up and started running with it. So, like the idea that you could have that sort of massive of a change that that the Earth is not the center of the universe, which it kind of looks that way. I mean, that's, that was not a, that was not a crazy idea. Idea. I tell my students if we didn't tell you, if we just taught you the scientific method. We told you, you go figure it out. <laughs> you figure it out where, you know, what, how, how, how nature is and how, uh, you know, what the earth is like. You, you would probably be geocentric. It, it, you know, you, you go out in your parking lot and it, and it looks like the, the sun is, is moving. It's going around us. Um, and so, yeah, it, it, it took a long time for, you know, for that sort of change to happen. But once that happens, once you get to the, the heliocentric view, yeah, thing, things just really start to change. So I think it was overall, it was just a climate of change that you could start to challenge this kind of uh, Aristotelian hegemony uh, in, in natural philosophy. Um, yeah, I think it was because there was so much other change going on at the time. It's really interesting. Um, and it's really helpful to connect those two ideas, Jeff, as you just did. Um, how about like the naturalist? naturalistic version that we're taught about today because i think about like even like going to school like when i was middle school um i don't really know if i really learned anything if anything about like the rise of like christian principles and modern science it's gonna be like okay like here's the science guys like this is what's going on in the world and that was it um how do we get this naturalistic version taught today yeah you didn't yeah you 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 learned as, as I did. It's been it's been around for uh, just over a hundred years. A very naturalized view, really, of of, of just nature altogether, but specifically science um, uh, and the laws of nature in particular, which you know, I keep keep coming back to. Um, today, we think of if anything, we think of the laws as kind of like. Um, in contrast to theism, maybe in tension with theism. So like if you can explain something in terms of the laws of nature, well, you don't you don't need God anymore. So if anything, like they're they're you know they're in conflict. And and that idea, that conflict idea, if you had if you had tried to pass that by Isaac Newton or Rene Descartes or anybody in the in the scientific revolution, they've been very puzzled. Like you, like you know, you can't you can't separate laws from God. It's that's where they come from. So this change, this naturalistic change, this is something else I've I've, I've discovered um, fairly recently. Um, uh, it, it wasn't it wasn't an accident. Uh, I would have thought that things just kind of got more naturalistic, you know, just incrementally over time. Right. Um, and it turns out, no, there was actually um, uh, somewhat of an intention to to naturalize science, at least in the in the Anglo-American world. I know more about what was going on in Britain and the United States than than than, than Europe, um, than, than continental Europe. So a, a lot of a lot of what we think of as science, especially um, biological science, in the 17th and 18th centuries, this was this was a part-time gig. It wasn't as if there were thousands of people who were who were science teachers, you know, in the universities like there are today. Uh, like I said, they would have called themselves natural philosophers. The uh, the word scientist wasn't even coined until the 1800s. The word physicist wasn't even coined until the 1800s. So 
Before that, a, a lot of clergy contributed to science, especially in Britain. Um, and then there was pushback in the in the 1800s. The the deists with, with a D um, who believed that there was a creator God, but they didn't believe in any sort of revealed religion. They didn't believe in Christianity or Islam or, or Judaism. They didn't believe there was a creator, and that was it. The deists and then more liberal, liberal um, theologically liberal Anglicans wanted to um, separate out the, the, the clergy from science. They, they wanted to, to, to split them out, make science naturalistic. So people like Thomas Huxley, John Tyndale, John Draper, they, they wanted a strict separation between science and what we think of as, as organized religion. And once again, the laws of nature, they play a really central role in all this because, like I said, Everyone prior to, to their time associated the laws with God. So Huxley and others came up with, with an alternative view. And it's what we would call today, if you would Google like a, a regularity theory of laws, this is, this is kind of the view that they came up with. And what they said was the laws, they're just, they're just regular sequences of events. So things like the temperature drops, you see the temperature drop below 32 degrees Fahrenheit and you see water freezing. And it does that again and again, temperature drops, water freezes, temperature drops, water freezes. And what they said is that regularity that we see, that is a law of nature. And, that, and that's all there is to it. And so the laws of nature don't like govern reality. There's no God in it. It's just, it's just a vet. this thing happens and then that thing happens. And that's all there is to a law. Uh, and then from there, they used a, a kind of wedge strategy. Um, they said, look, you can, you can stand with, you have to pick a side. You can stand with um, superstition and priests and blind faith, or you can be on our side, the side of reason and progress and, and scientific naturalism. They called their own movement scientific naturalism. And so what, what side do you want to be on, right? You got to choose which side do you want to be on? Um, and part of what they argued was when you choose, you have to realize the laws belong to us. The laws are on, on our side of the ledger because it's we, the, the naturalistic scientists, we're the ones who use laws. We're the ones who discover the laws, not the not the, not the, the religious people. So, so our side gets the laws, and ultimately they won that, that debate. Um, they, they ended up winning, which is ultimately then why today we think of the laws in, in, in purely secular terms. Um, this, this wedge strategy, it's also where we get this, this warfare model between science and religion that I mentioned before. So Huxley and Draper and people like Andrew Dixon White, they were all claiming that, that there was this um, you know, conflict all the way back between science and religion. And so you have to choose, you have to choose which side you're on. Jeff, I'm wondering then, like you've talked about like, these different ideas with regards to the principles. Uh, how important was theism to like the rise of these um, scientific like shaping principles that we have today? I think there are some of them, not all of them, but some of them that I, I just don't see how you get without theism. So again, laws of nature, again, there's this really strong analogy that they had between a human king and God. So in their view, you know, human kings declare the laws for, for their land and God is the king of all physical reality. And so, you know, God, God declares the laws. Very, very strong analogy. I don't know how you get a notion of laws of nature w without that. Um, I briefly mentioned um, beauty uh, and, and mathematical elegance in those laws that that could be a kind of guide to this to the to the right laws. We see this especially in the 20th century scientists not not always theistic, typically not theistic physicists who were using beauty as a kind of an elegance in the equations as a guide. When they had a set of equations and they thought of them as being just too ugly, too complex, they thought the right equations were something else. we have to keep going. We have to keep drilling down. But it's kind of weird, right? There's no reason in a naturalistic world why really anything should be beautiful, beautiful. Why the why the fundamental um, laws of nature uh, should be mathematical and that they should have a kind of beauty to them. I don't, I don't think you get that without God. I don't think the uniformity of nature uh, is something you would likely get with, without theism. Um, this is because this is a well-known problem for that, um, that regularity theory of laws that I mentioned before that, that goes back to a, a view of causation that, that David Hume has. And, um, and it, it has a well-known problem because under the regularity theory, what they would say is, you know, it just, it just so happens that 
water freezes when the temperature drops to to a certain point. Uh, there's no guarantee that that's going to keep happening. There's no guarantee it's going to happen tomorrow. That's just the pattern we've observed up to this point. It could be that that all the generalizations that we've come up with, all, all of the regularities we've observed, they could fail at, at any time. We hope not, right? We, we hope that airplanes don't start falling out of the sky, but there's just, there's no guarantee. There's no way to know that, that they won't. The early moderns, if you go back further, you go back to Newton and, and Descartes and Boyle and everybody else, <clears throat> they, they didn't have that problem because what they said was not only did God ordain the laws, but, but God made sure that they won't change. Um, so given that, given that we have a kind of guarantee they're not going to change, that we can trust induction. We go out and, and, and study you know, the, the physical world mm -hmm. and make generalizations based on, on inductive uh, data. Uh, we, we have reason to believe that, that nature isn't going to go off the rails tomorrow. So yeah, I do think there are, are, are several shaping principles in here um, that are... I, you know, is, is there some sort of, I, I can't really tell you what the counterfactual world would look like. What, how would things be done, you know, without, without theism, without God in the picture. Um, but there's some of them, yeah, I, I think that you just wouldn't have, or at least I have a hard time figuring out how you could come up with these without, without theism in the worldview. That's really helpful. Thank you, Jeff. Um, one more question I was thinking about, um, and I think you answered a lot of the question in, in the response you just gave, but I'm just curious if you have any more thoughts. Um, earlier you mentioned like the water example of like water, maybe it gets below 32 degrees and it freezes. Um, and we're trying to think about, okay, like maybe there is like some sort of scientific like law um, that kind of governs this. Um, the question I was thinking about is like, why bring God into this picture? Like why think like is how this relates to God? Couldn't someone say, okay, well, water gets below 32 degrees, it freezes, that's it. Um, and similarly, couldn't they say something similar with regards to other scientific principles and try to say like, well, God just is unnecessary in trying to like explain the world. We don't need God to like give it. So yeah. What are your thoughts here? Well, everything I've been saying, you know, you know, in the, in the podcast today is mostly historical. So I'm, I'm saying this is how it came about 17th and 18th century. You know, um, you know, this is how God played a role in giving us these, these shaping principles, uh, you know, at, at the top of the pyramid. Um, why would you do it today? Well, it does go back to that that problem of induction. Um, this is if, if you if you read any of the literature uh, on the laws of nature, you're going to have uh, kind of a split. Uh, one there's one camp which we now call uh, the, the Humean view of the laws of nature that looks like like David Hume's view of the of the regularity theory, and, and they're going to want to say that that all that exists are these events, things happen in the world, and some of them happen in perfectly regular ways. So there are are some things we observe, and we're going to call those the laws of nature. There are other sorts of Humean views, but what they but they but mainly what they believe in. They don't want to believe in anything more than just, just natural events, things that change over time. And they all have this problem of induction because on, on all the human views, there's just no guarantee that things won't that nature, as I say, won't won't go off the rails tomorrow. That things won't radically change tomorrow. There's no guarantee that how things have looked in the past, they will continue to look that way in the future. Then there's two other camps. Uh, one um, that really I've been talking about, and I didn't give the name. The one with a very strong view of the laws of nature, kind of like the early moderns had, um, is called nomological realism. And so, on the nomological realist view, no, look, there there aren't just there aren't just regularities in nature. They're really the laws of nature are out there to be discovered. These are principles and powers that actually you know are, are, control how things go. Um, so it isn't it isn't just that they happen to have have certain regularities. The laws actually kind of kind of control the way things can go, and so we know that things won't go off the rail tomorrow. So um, I, I think you can. So if you if you look um, at some of the, some of the things, but my, my most recent book. Um, uh, I do give an argument for why it is that that human is a uh, human view of, of laws really is deficient. Uh, it, it's it's going to not guarantee induction. It's going to have problems in other ways. You're going to need something that keeps nature, uh, you know, running on track. And I can't go through the whole. This would be like a whole other podcast to <laughs> take you all the way through. But I do think that currently, um, if, if it's not the best alternative, it's it's certainly in play. It is among the best alternatives is to have what I call a, a decree 
creedalist view of the laws of nature, uh, that, that the laws are God's decrees. And this is what keeps, keeps nature on the track. I think you're going to need something that keeps nature running on the rails that guarantees that planes aren't going to fall the sky tomorrow. I think you want some sort of metaphysical principle for that. And I do think that, that in, in my, if you are a theist, put it this way, I, I can say it this way quickly. If you are a theist, so you already have God in, in your ontology, you think God exists, then yeah, this is a very natural thing to think that God is doing, setting up the rules for how nature is going to go and then, and then keeping it going in just that way. Well, perhaps that's another really great idea for another time. I have you on in the future, Jeff. Um, thank you so much for coming on today. I really appreciate you, your time. You do a really good job of explaining um, what seems to be very like maybe like hard to grasp <laughs> topics and you just make it very clear and concise and it's like I'm tracking with you. Um, you have any like last thoughts or things you want to say, Jeff, before we start to wrap up? No, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty good. I just want to, yeah, if you, I do, you know, I don't know your, your you know, viewership all that well, but if there are, there are folks out there, if there's students out there and you are, you know, you're a little worried about like, like science and doesn't that, you, like the warfare metaphor has, has impinged on you and that people have tried to, you know, voice this idea that science and religion have always been income. Just, I mean, I, just remember like the, the history is on our side. Okay. When you look at the history of modern science, uh, th these are theists and, and, and overwhelmingly mostly Christians. So, um, yeah, don't, uh, don't get upset. Don't get upset. Uh, uh, look at the history a little bit more. And I think it'll actually help you quite a bit and in, in, in freeing you up from this notion that somehow, yeah, science is not, is not on our side. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Jeff. How can people like follow you, connect with you, things like that? Oh, uh, so I, I have a, I have a Twitter account, I guess they call it X now. So you can find, you can find me there. Um, you can find my papers at, at a, at a, as a collection, a website, um, uh, academia.edu. Uh, you search for my name, uh, there. And if you want to see what, what books that I've written, um, uh, and one that I've edited, uh, go on Amazon, put in Kapersky, you'll, you'll find me pretty fast. Well, Jeff, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. I'm so grateful for you, your time, your work, everything that you're doing. Um, and yeah, I'll leave some links down below where people can follow Jeff, connect with Jeff, things like, or Jeff, things like that. Um, if you like it here in Apologetics, be sure to subscribe, leave a like, all that fun stuff. And if you value what we do, you can become a patron at patreon.com slash Uh You can join for as little as $2 a month and your support would be huge. But Jeff, one last time, thank you so much for coming on. It's been great talking with you today. You bet. Glad to be here, Zach. Thanks very much. Well, thank you everyone for listening. I hope you have a good one and God bless. We'll catch you next time.